Hi, let's test your reef keeping acumen. Question number one. You receive an acro pack from a local fish store. They are in great shape, but upon inspection, you notice one of these crawling on one of the frag plugs. What is the best way to handle the situation? File a credit card dispute if the vendor refuses to refund your money because he claims parasite-free coral. Cut the frags off the plugs and proceed with your normal quarantine slash acclimation practices. Put the vendor on blast on the local forums and internet. Dip them in at least five times the recommended concentration of potassium chloride. Throw all the frags away. There are hundreds and hundreds of flatworms in nature and this happens to be one of them. It's important that you could distinguish these guys from acropora eating flatworms. These little guys like to eat plankton, algae, and even waste. They can multiply like crazy in our tanks, but I think most reefers will find that their numbers wane spontaneously with or without the help of fish like wrasses and damsels. The way that you can distinguish these guys from acropora eating flatworms is their bodyboard shape. You can see this concave backside that acropora eating flatworms just doesn't have. So don't freak out when you see these little guys. To me, it's just a little piece of that biodiversity that everybody craves nowadays. Question number two. Regarding shipping and receiving coral from online sellers, which of the following statements is not true? The shipping companies increase shipping rates every year. Tuesdays are generally not a good day to receive coral. You should always be familiar with the seller's DOA policy before purchasing. Regarding coral parasites, purchasing from pure aquaculture vendors is generally lower risk than buying from chop shops. The temperature of the water when you receive them is the best indication of how well the corals were packed. Regarding the inside box temperature, it's better to err on the side of a little cool than too hot. The purpose of this question is to remind you that when you receive the corals, the inside box temperature is really just a snapshot of a 20 hour long journey. For example, I have to drop the packages off by 2 p.m. They could spend around 5 hours before they actually take off to the hub. At the hub, they'll spend another 3 hours. When they reach the destination airport, it could take up to 6 hours before it arrives at your door. So as you can see, there are a lot of different environments that the package may encounter. And the job of the shipper is not to keep the box at a perfect 78 degrees. Rather, the job of the shipper is to keep the box at a reasonable temperature and to minimize harsh temperature swings. In my opinion, the best indication of how well corals were packed is their general health when you receive them and the couple days thereafter. All these other answers are true. Question number three. A reefer new to the hobby has a 1.5 year old 100 gallon tank with a handful of LPS and softies that are doing great. A Bali green slimer frag acquired four months ago also has good color and is encresting well. But an Acropora frag pack was purchased two months ago and the acros have lost some color, appear to have darkened, weak polyp extension, and are barely encrusting. The tank is 48 by 24 by 20, about 70 pounds of live rock. 1 inch satin bed which is kept sparkling clean and even, there are 11 fish total. 2 gyres on the back glass at about 60% for 50 times display tank turnover. 4 bulb T5 retrofit and 2 Radeon XR30 G6s with corals getting on average 300 par. Alkalinity is 8, calcium is 420, magnesium is 1375, nitrate is 8, and phosphate is 0.06. ESV 2 part is dosed through a J-Bow doser, 30 gallon sump with an appropriate size protein skimmer, roller mat, algae scrubber. Given all this information, what is the best way to color up the frags? Dose neonitro and neophos to get nitrate at 15 and phosphate at 0.15. Increase the intensity of the lights to 400 plus par. Remove the algae scrubber and consider shutting off the skimmer for 6 hours per day. Dose aminos and or feed engineered marine plankton powder coral food. Increase the flow. Start dosing kalkwasser. Don't buy from this vendor because his pictures are likely over doctored. The correct answer is to increase the flow. I think many aspiring acroporists have heard at one point that flow is important, but I don't think that many reefers understand just how important it is. In this example, 
there's a ton of rock in this tank with only 50 times turnover. There is also this weird statement that he keeps his sand bed sparkling clean and even. I threw that in there because I noticed reefers who are very particular about their sand bed, or those who strongly resist adding powerheads to their display due to aesthetics, are more likely to fall into this trap. But I'm not immune to this trap either. In my 50 gallon low boy, I tried to get away with one 4,000 gallon per hour pump, but I realized it just wasn't enough. Corals weren't doing great on the far end. About three weeks after I added an additional pump, the corals on the far end improved in color, growth, polyp extension, and overall health. There is a general rule that SPS tanks should have 50 to 100 times display tank turnover. In my opinion, this should be a little higher, more like 70 times to 120 times. The subtlety of this rule is that if all of your flow is indirect flow, you should be on the higher range of this spectrum. However, if more of your flow is indirect, then you can get away with being on the lower end of the spectrum. And just for reference, all of my tanks are getting over 100 times display tank turnover. Trust me when I tell you that you will be surprised by how much proper flow will improve the polyp extension, color, growth, and overall health of your Acropora. I see a lot of new reefers jumping to these other solutions when the whole time it's improper flow that is hindering their progress. Question number four. Despite changing the sediment and carbon blocks, a reefer has persistent, foul-smelling RODI product water. What is the most likely cause? A dirty top-off reservoir, the DI resin is spent, it only happens if the source water isn't treated with chloramines, bacteria growth on the RO membrane. I saw a forum post about this and nobody knew the answer, which is why I decided to include it. The correct answer is bacteria growth on the membrane. This is what's called biofouling of the RO membrane. You really don't hear it that much in the hobby because most people use tap water, which is sanitized with chloramines. But this is a well-known problem to the commercial water purification industry, especially when they use seawater or well water or some other dirty source. In a nutshell, bacteria has deposited and is now growing on the RO membrane. When this happens, if you pull your RO membrane out, you will likely see colonies of bacteria living on the surface on the intake side. It will look like little pieces of snot growing on the membrane. In my case, bleaching the whole unit did not solve the problem. It's probably because the unit was over 20 years old, and I also had a old booster pump which was not supplying adequate pressure to the membrane. To prevent this, I recommend washing your hands well before changing out the filters. I recommend not touching them at all with your bare hands if you can. Also, make sure you have a strong pressure feeding the membrane at least 70 psi. And also, make sure you flush the membrane at least 30 seconds before and after each use. Question number 5. Two-year-old mixed reef tank measuring 48 by 24 by 20 for 100 gallons. Some Acropora, mainly the stags, are growing but their growth pattern is uneven and irregular. Other Acropora are barely encrusting and some have poor color. Some Acros have decent color but aren't growing. All Acropora have been in the system for over a year. LPS are doing great. There are three XR15 G5 Blues run at 100%. Low Aquascape made of 30 pounds of Tonga Branch. Acros are on top of the scape receiving about 250 to 300 par. It's bare bottom. Flows with two MP40s at 100% for 100 times display tank turnover, placed on each side of the tank. Parameters are 10, 440, 1400, 10, and 0.08. The reefer is using a Red Sea Reef Care program. Saturated calc washer is dosed at night, which was started three months ago. No other additives. A 30 gallon sump with appropriate size protein skimmer, 100 micron filter sock, bucket refugium with ketomorpha, bright well salt. Given the information above, what is the most likely cause of uneven acropora growth in some acros, poor color and growth in other acros? Calcwasser wasn't started earlier. Inadequate light coverage. The corals that aren't growing have a parasite, like acropora eating flatworms. Parameters aren't stable because there isn't automated testing slash dosing. Tanks usually hit their stride at the three year mark. Kalkwasser slurry is more effective than regular saturated kalk. The Kato is sucking up all the trace elements and competing for nutrients. 
So the answer here is inadequate light coverage. This is another thing that I commonly see in the hobby. It's reefers who are trying to have a beautiful acropora dominated tank, but are trying to do that with the bare minimum when it comes to lighting. And this is often what I see in folks who are moving from LPS to acropora if they don't add more light. What I see in these tanks are some acros are growing, but others have poor color and others aren't growing at all. And what throws these reefers off is an over-reliance on PAR. As you can see in this example, PAR is actually okay in this tank. But three XR15s over a tank of this footprint is not going to cut it. But don't take my word for it. Whenever you see a beautiful acropora dominated tank that's absolutely filled in with colonies, make sure you evaluate the lighting. You will see if they're running all LEDs that they are exceeding the manufacturer's recommendation for light fixture per given area. If they are not running LEDs, you will see that the entire top of this tank is covered with lighting. Question number seven. Question number six. Regarding phosphates and coral health, which of the following is not true? Phosphates get bound up in the calcium carbonate skeleton. Elevated phosphate levels can inhibit stony coral growth. Elevated phosphate levels can increase stony coral growth. Bacteria on the coral can take up phosphate and transfer it to the coral host. None of the above. All of these answers are actually true. Investigators have found that phosphate treatment will improve growth in certain acropora species, and other studies done by other investigators have found that phosphate treatment will reduce growth in other species. And this is the same thing that I find in my reef tanks, is that some corals love it, some corals hate it, and some can care less. But there is a hidden implication here, and it's that if you're going to take advice from a certain acropora person, make sure that you are keeping, or make sure that they keep the same type of acropora that you want to keep. All right, so it's something that you really need to take in mind. Question number seven. Which of the following is the easiest way to reduce phosphate levels long term? Dose nitrate so that the bacteria and corals can take up excess phosphate. You are stuck with high phosphates because it's bound in the dry rock and it's leaching out continuously. Run high capacity GFO. Dose vinegar, vodka, or sugar so that the bacteria can consume it. Stop feeding coral foods, Fido and Nori. So I realize that the word easiest makes this question a little ambiguous. Coral foods, Fido and Nori are totally fine if you do not have phosphate problems in your tank. But I can't tell you how many times I hear of reefers who have phosphate problems and continue to put this stuff into their tank regularly. Nori is a big one. The reefing community believes that nori is absolutely necessary for tang health. I did a literature review and I could only find one paper that suggested, although not conclusive, that nori, more specifically the vitamin C and the vitamin A in nori can help prevent head and lateral line erosion. But it also must be pointed out that other algaes, including other algaes that grow in our tank, also contain vitamin E, vitamin A, and vitamin C. So it's quite possible that if your tanks are picking at your rocks regularly, that they are getting some of the essential nutrients that they can get from nori. Again, there's nothing wrong with feeding nori if you don't have phosphate problems. My only point is that it probably won't hurt to cut down significantly or to cut out altogether nori or until you get rid of your phosphate problems. And just so you know, I haven't fed my tanks nori for over a year. And within the last two months, I even cut out flake food and pellet food. So my tanks have been only getting frozen mices, frozen brine shrimp, and frozen krill for the past two months, and they are just doing great. Feel free to ask about the progress of this little experiment in about two months in the comments below. There's another hidden lesson. So there's another hidden lesson in this question, and it's that if you could solve a problem in your tank by removing something, that's going to be better than adding something, especially in the long term. And that's another reason why this answer is correct. Question number eight. You are waiting for a coral shipment that was to come this morning. 
outside temperature is 50 degrees. The delivery driver shows up at 8 p.m. to drop off the package. The bags feel a little cool to the touch, and the corals appear stressed, indicated by poor slash no polyp extension, and they also appear a little light. Nothing is floating around in the bags, their tissue appears intact, and the water is clear and not foul smelling. What is the best way to get these in the tank to maximize survivability? Temperature acclimate, then dip, then drip acclimate, then place them in the tank. Temperature acclimate, place them on a rack, and then light acclimate. Throw them away because the seller is not responsible for carrier delays. Ask your doctor for a prescription for antibiotics and dip them. Temperature acclimate, cut off the plug, then mount them on the rocks. Shipping coral is generally stressful, especially for delicate corals such as Acropora. And the point of this question is that, in order to maximize survivability of your new frags, you really need to think about coral acclimation in terms of stress. With that principle in mind, it's easy to pick the correct answer here. It's the one that subjects the frags to the least amount of stress as possible. Dipping can be stressful. Cutting off the plug and regluing is stressful. Even lighting can be stressful. So you really need to think, when you get these frags, what can I do? Or perhaps more importantly, what should I not do in order to survive the survivability of these frags. There's another important side point here and it's that you really need to think about who you're buying your corals from. Because on one hand, if you buy from somebody who has strict quarantine practices and pretty much guarantees no coral parasites, well now you feel less obligated to dip. But on the other hand, if you buy from somebody who's a little more loosey-goosey with their coral quarantine or who is a chop shop, now you have to dip them. Now you have to cut them off the frag plug. And guess what? You are just subjecting that coral to more stress than it really wants at this point. And even if they survive that gauntlet, you have to realize that the additional stress that you gave them is prolonging the time that they will develop in your reef tank. So it's something that you really need to think about. Well, thank you for watching. Feel free to leave any questions in the comments section below.